Hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Dale Hawthorne. Are there pastors who won't let people go? If you attend their church and leave, do they continue to obsess over you? And the question is, yes, there are a minority. Most of the pastors I know are conscientious, hardworking, and who love the Lord, seeking to follow his word. And I uh, do know uh, some, though, who if people leave their churches, they become obsessed. They may, were, may have been obsessed to begin with. So here's how to avoid becoming one. Here's how to deal with one. And I think if you find some of these pastors in some of the most some some of the case, most extreme cases, really that pastor needs to step down or be removed by the elders or the denomination. However, as not fulfilling scriptural qualifications of eldership, first of all, is in First Timothy three, Titus two, First Peter five, and also there may be some legal exposure for the pastor and for the church if they don't uh, deal with this. So I've served the pastor and I've known a couple of people like this, but I do want to say, if you're a pastor and I'm talking to you right now, if you're a pastor, learn to let people go when they leave your church for any reason. Pray with them. Pray for them. Pray for them. But don't make them the center of your prayer life. Make your church the center of your prayer life. Let them go. Let them go. Renounce them in prayer into the hands of God. And true, there may be problems that they had with you or with the church or even other problems for which they've been suffering in silence at your church. It may be they need to get away to deal with them. People rarely run away from a loving church with sound Bible teaching, but they do run from interfering, controlling, and abusive people in churches. And if that person is not you, if you're not the interfering, controlling, and abusive person, you may still need to let them go to find a safe haven. And scripture does call us to remain in fellowship with other believers. I don't know anywhere in scripture where it says where we must remain in a particular church where interfering, controlling, and abusive people continue to wreak their mischief and pain upon us, especially if the elders, pastors, the others in charge in that church tolerate, encourage, or even participate in that same interference and abuse. The thing is, though, if you find that it's not a pastor, if you find that someone else within the church treating a person that way, if you, if you deal with them strongly and scripturally, they may still direct against you what they've been doing to that other person so there are three idols coming back to thinking of this in the terms of pastors that lead to double lives first money yeah we know that uh, some pastors have a problem with money sex yeah we know some problems that have had a problem with that they usually uh, lose their position right after that gets found out but power power is the last temptation which has often been indulged perhaps over and over. And that person may still remain in the place of being a pastor of a church up there regularly preaching, but perhaps there's an obsession with a person over they want, which they want to have power or more people or over the congregation. And it's been indulged so long that it's become a demonic stronghold in that person's life. And yeah, if you've been over any of the uh, literature on abuse, power trips, control, abuse, those that connection right there, that relation is well, well established. So right now, I want to tell you, pastor, church leaders, elders, if people leave your church, uh, beware of any pastor attempting any of these things or anyone in leadership. We're trying to do any of these things. First of all, anyone who's trying to track them to any churches where they're attending or ask anyone you know that there's a friend of that person to 
keep an eye on them and report on what happens to them. In some cases, this may violate anti-stalking laws. Look at your the laws for your locality, your state, wherever. There are laws against stalking people. And that may violate those laws. So there may be legal exposure there. Number two, don't keep on trying to get them to come back to attend your church again, especially if they become involved in another church. Yeah, you've been fired as their pastor. You need to take that back to yourself. Consider that for yourself, what that means for you, what you need to change. Not keep on trying to get them back under your church, your church again, especially not if you want to get them under your thumb. Don't do that. Number three. Don't express any concerns about them publicly or privately or write any letters or emails or have any discussions about them with the people of the new church and pastor of the new church if they start attending a new church. Don't do that. That may be legally slander, liable if it's written down, and um, if there's any, if that person has been suffered to the point where they're seeking any sort of counseling, that opens up a whole new kind of worms right there. So, some years ago, uh, V. Raymond Edmond wrote about a tremendous damage that he knew about. He was president of Wheaton College at, uh, back during the 1940s, early 1950s. And he said, you know, talk about letter writing campaigns that have brought much suffering to many believers, both pastors and otherwise. Letters that were anonymous, the anonymous letters that uh, and now we do it most a lot of times through emails, instant messages, things like that, other ways to spread that message. So, especially along with this, do not express any of your concerns or personal disagreements or quarrels with a fellow pastor, even if it's under the on a letter or email under the guise of a referral. And again, this may meet legal definitions for libel slander or defamation defamation of character just don't do that keep it to yourself pray about it before the lord consider what this means about how you have served as a pastor if this points to any malpractice as a pastor on your point you need to deal with that letting competences go letting people share slander with you backstabbing that person to you and also, again, if you know any medical treatment this person has undergone, and this includes, and especially includes, counseling and psychotherapy, be extremely careful what you say. You may want to keep that entirely under wrap. Keep that entirely to yourself. If that person has anything to say to a pastor of a new church you're attending, let them do that. In the United States, you might be opening yourself up for legal action under HIPAA regulations. And if you, even if you think they need counseling, do not refer them to counseling yourself. Do not do so without their knowledge of doing that. Simply don't, because that could open yourself up for legal action also. So there are a number of reasons why people may leave churches. Some of them are okay getting married. Yeah, they get married and they're attending different churches and they decide on a new church, perhaps. I may decide to go to the spouse, to the bride's church, the groom's group church, etc. People move away. People get new jobs, <coughs> transfer, etc. So there are reasonable reasons. People die. People leave your church because of death. They may become may not be able to be there because uh, they become physically infirm, they get older. So the two reasons which I have for you to take a look at as a pastor, for elders also to consider, to take note. If you see this happen for yourself or for others, people who leave a church because the pastor has gotten flaky and weird, that's the best way to put it. Sometimes the words and actions of a pastor can show going away from some sort of spiritual, mental, and emotional stability. It's difficult to be a pastor. There's some real emotional hazards, as uh, I heard Archibald Hart once uh, 
put in uh, uh, past uh, late uh, past uh, psychologists associated with uh, Four Seminary in a seminar some years ago. There's some real emotional hazards for the ministry. And sometimes the pastor may, may be in a really difficult spot. We pray for them. Pray for them to come out of that. But um, if it's afflicting people of the congregation, some of them more than others, some people may need to leave to find a safer church to attend. And especially, second, pastoral aggression. Pastors, as Arch Malthart repeatedly said, need to work on dealing with their anger in a scriptural fashion. They need, we cannot have pastors developing and pursuing grudges against members of their congregation, developing hatred. Pe people who've been involved with their ministry, even their, may, never became a, an official member. We don't do that. They may have received genuine hurts from these people, genuine disappointments. Sometimes the, the people were simply following the Lord in the best way they knew how, and that pastor had different expectations and they didn't fulfill their expectations. So what? Those weren't your expectations to pull, put on them. They needed to follow the Lord and Scripture. Either way, need to deal with it in a scriptural fashion. That's the need right there, dealing with it in a scriptural fashion. Love, forgiveness, forgoing anger, not repeating it, not making up stuff. Sometimes pastoral aggression can come from such things as mild disagreements or um, their rivalries in the church. So pastors take note. Elders take note of this pastoral aggression. And sometimes this can even find its way if someone's seeking employment, honestly, if a person going into ministry, I think that many times the files of our pastors, rep churches, and denominational offices do contain documents, and, such as letters, such as Edmund put, uh, spoke about, which could contain things which amount to de facto slander and libel, defamation character against fellow pastors, perhaps fellow believers, perhaps. I think that we need to be careful of this. In one of my previous talks, I talked about how it's been amazing to me over all the years that I've been involved as a believer. And that's been a lot of years. And I've seen, and it's not because I'm young, naive. I'm not young. I'm not naive about how people act. But it's amazing to me how vulnerable some people in the body of Christ have been to receive and pass on slander, hearsay, and rumor. And the very least that any leader, anyone who's called a pastor living, following Jesus, can do is to not to receive slander, not to act on slander, not to act on slander, hearsay, and rumors. And especially if you yourself have been devastated if it happened to you. And if you served for any time in the place of being a pastor, oh yeah, you probably have suffered yourself from slander, hearsay, and rumor at some point. So, if you're interacting with a pastor who's showing these type of obsessions, if another pastor even calls you to tell you about someone who started to attend your church or sending you letters or emails about that person, here's what I would advise. First of all, let that pastor know you are prepared to let that person know everything that has been said or written to you about that person and that he or she will get a copy of that letter or email for his consideration. Give the pastor at that point a chance to take it all back. And a lot of pastors who would try to do that will backtrack at that point. That person is under official church discipline. That's a different matter, which I'm speaking about right here which uh, there are procedures for dealing with that. But this is just someone sending you letters, emails about this person as if they're warning you off about a potential problem person. And the problem person may be the person sending, not the person about whom it's being sent. So if that pastor starts to backtrack and try to get you from doing any such thing, ask for a complete retraction of everything that was said or written, everything that was done, especially if it's done in a letter or email. And ask for that person to do that as a matter of repentance before God, of slander. 
that type of backstabbing. We shouldn't be permitting it to happen between pastors and churches. We need to stop it and nip it in the bud. So that's what I have to say. I think that, uh, I hope that uh, it becomes less and less necessary for me to ever say anything about this ever again. We're called to love one another, to speak the truth and love, to be at peace with one another, and to let our gentleness be known to all. So those are the things the scripture calls us to. When we do this stuff, we're really doing some stuff which the Lord doesn't, uh, we can have the same thing that the Lord said about David's adultery with Bathsheba, and the thing displeased the Lord. The thing David had done displeased the Lord. So I think that these things displease the Lord also. So let's stop them, let's knit them bud, let's make sure that we don't let these things happen from ourselves. So thank you for your time, thank you for your attention. This has been kind of heavy, but I hope that it does help. I hope it does mean that someone out there may find a relief from obsession and someone may find peace through this. So thank you again.